I suspect he's trying to cut his losses, bring the thing to an end roughly where it is. And the Ukrainians, of course, are not going to accept that. They want all their territory back. They want war crimes. They want reparations. Big gap, therefore, still between the two sides. The Ukrainian Foreign Minister, Dmitry Kaleba, says that his government wants a peace summit within two months at the United Nations with Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez as mediator. It comes as the Russian President, Vladimir Putin, shared over the weekend that Moscow is ready to negotiate, but said Ukraine and the West were refusing to compromise. Let's talk to Sir Tony Brenton, former UK ambassador to Russia. Good morning, Tony. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking the time to speak to us. Now, the Ukrainian foreign minister's comments here, a surprising change of tact, really. Do you, do you expect a summit to actually take place before the one-year mark from the start of the war? Well, it's not that surprising. You need to understand that there's a certain amount of diplomatic shadow boxing going on at the moment. Quite a substantial proportion of the world community want to see peace. So there's a sort of diplomatic bonus for whichever side seems most in, in, in favour of peace. Putin has been talking increasingly volubly over the last few weeks about how he's ready to negotiate. He may mean it. He is, after all, losing the war, but there's no sign of any very material concessions he's ready to make. The Ukrainians now obviously feel the need to offer their own peace offer or suggestion, hence their idea for this summit. But if you read the small print, what they're talking about is a summit which the Russians will only be able to participate in if, for example, they, end the, they accept the possibility of war trials, which they're not going to. Mm. So all of this noise, you can be weakly encouraged by it. The fact is that if you start talking about peace, then sooner or later you're going to find yourself under pressure to put your actions where your, where your words are. But I think we're still quite a long way from that at the moment. Yeah, you mentioned that the state of the war midwinter in Ukraine. What will Putin be looking to negotiate? Is the war fatigue and his failure and his ambitions now playing such a big part? Well, I obviously don't know what goes on in Putin's head. But um, my guess is that he accepts that his original aims of basically taking over Ukraine have failed. And he would more or less settle for what he's got at the moment in terms of he's got territory, he's got links to Crimea, he's got Crimea, which is absolutely central to how this thing turns out. He's got a lot of mobilised troops who haven't yet joined on the battlefield. So I suspect he's trying to cut his losses, bring the thing to an end roughly where it is. And the Ukrainians, of course, are not going to accept that. They want all their territory back. They want war crimes. They want reparations. Big gap, therefore, still between the two sides. How many back-channel negotiations between people like the US and China are actually taking place here? Well, I mean, there are contacts going on, obviously. Um, the, the big question is whether there are any serious contacts between the Ukrainian side and the Russian side. And there's absolutely no evidence of that, I have to say, sadly. Um, each side is talking to itself, talking to its close allies, but they're not visibly talking to each other. Tony, Ukrainian officials are set to officially question whether Russia should be removed as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, that there are five uh, permanent members of the council, Russia, China, the US, the UK and France, uh, and they have this status, meaning they can veto any vote. Do you think that's something that we're going to be increasingly hearing a push for? I, if you want my view, I mean, I was responsible for the UN at one point in the Foreign Office, and this is a slightly balmy initiative. It will get headlines. You can see the moral force behind it. Could like, it happen? It, Could it happen, though? No. It's a short answer, because in order to change the Charter of the United Nations, which is what provides Russia with its permanent membership, you need to get past the fact that Russia has a veto. So it makes noise. It focuses international attention on how appallingly Russia have behaved and how inconsistent their behaviour is with the status of being a permanent member of the Security Council. But I think in terms of its likelihood of success, that likelihood is zero. So, Tony, thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you. So, Tony Brenton there, the former UK ambassador to uh, Russia from 2004 to 2008. No chance then, uh, yeah. from Tony, of them being forced out because I, we've been hearing this a lot from various different people, including on the programme this morning, about this idea of removing Russia as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which they've been on for so many years. But, you know, Tony, they're saying from experience of working uh, with the United Nations that actually this is just not going to happen. And, and it seems uh, any kind of negotiation or banishment for Russia is really tricky during this war, mm. um, uh, particularly when there's so much international diplomacy at stake. Do you want them on side or not?